In this video, I want to talk a little bit about how to create a requirements document in a way that's compatible with behavior-driven design, also known as given when then. First, I want to put some context around this. This is the manifesto for agile software development, and you see several contributors down here at the bottom. One who I want to point out is Ward Cunningham, a gentleman who I admire in our field of information technology. He is often credited as the inventor of the wiki, the person who coined the term technical debt, something that's a very interesting topic, and he's one of the people who signed off on this manifesto for agile software development. So, uh, I, when I read this, I almost want to read the last line first because I think it's important to keep that in context. While there is value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. So the Agile manifesto, manifesto doesn't say, don't follow a plan. It just says, we'd rather respond to change than follow a plan if given that decision. So what's the Agile manifesto? We prefer individuals and interaction over processes and tools. So get up and have a conversation. Uh, don't worry about this document hasn't been put in the correct repository, so on and so forth. You see this a lot in the workplaces that we have now where you have kind of an open office environment and it's common to ask people to help you out when you get stuck on something. Working software over comprehensive documentation. I can say in my career many times I've dealt with vendor software and I get a, a binder with 200 pages and I kind of want to say, yeah, that's great, but here's all I want to do. That looks very complicated. I often say, think of Shazam's approach. You open up Shazam, press anywhere, it tells you what song's playing. Very easy. You don't have to go through a login, through a main menu. It's just right there. Very helpful. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. So we want to make sure that the customer understands the processes that we're using and has bought into that. And then responding to change over following a plan. That can work very much in our favor because, number one, we understand the change is going to happen. Number two, we can tell our customers that we understand change is going to happen and therefore feel free to give us something that's only 80% complete in design. We'll take it from there with the knowledge that we're going to develop it, we're going to show it to you. You might like it, you might not. If you don't like it, we might have some rework. We understand that. So with that, and especially with the working software over comprehensive documentation, I'll show you a very simple requirements document for plant places or plant places mobile. So what we'll typically do is say as a blank, and then the analyst will fill out what that blank is. I want to be able to do something and get a certain result. So as a user, I want to be able to search for plants by any part of the name, genus, species, or cultivar name, uh, so that I can find plants that match my search criteria. So very a very simple English-like uh, instruction of, as a user, which is a noun, I want to be able to, so some kind of verb, and then I will get some kind of output from that verb. A quick note on dependencies and a quick note on assumptions. And now comes the important part. I think you'd probably agree with me that this line that I've written up above can be understood by someone who writes software as well as somebody who doesn't write software. And that's the whole idea. We all sit together. We all come up with this scenario. Additionally, once we've come up with a scenario, we elaborate it into a series of examples and given when then syntax. We do this in an English-like language. I mean, we do it in English, frankly. And the reason is, it's you, uh, the, the reason we do it in this format, not necessarily in English, but in this format, is we're using a ubiquitous language, a language that a business analyst can understand, a project manager, a quality analyst, and a developer. All four, and even more, have input into these examples. And again, I mean, English or whatever your native language is, it's just written in a way that's not programming. It's written in a way that sentences that somebody would speak so we can all understand it. Why is that so important? Well, my primary career is in software development, and I will speak firsthand and say a lot of times software developers like me tend to only think happy path. We don't tend to think of edge cases. But if you get some diverse opinions in the room, a business analyst, a quality analyst, a project manager, and a developer, you're likely to come across many scenarios 
which one person alone, regardless of that person's role, developer or business analyst or whatever, uh, more than just what one person would think of on his own or on her own. So we all sit down and we come up with these examples. Given a feed of plant data is available, when I search for Redbud, then I should receive at least one result with these attributes. attributes. Circus canadensis eastern redbud. And there's our happy path. Okay, so given a feed of plant data is available when I search for Quercus, then I should receive at least one result with Quercus rober and one with Quercus alba. So here a little more complicated than the first one where we have multiple results. Given a feed of plant data is available when I search for some kind of garbage, then I should receive zero results or an empty list. So this is an edge case. This is where the user has searched for something a little bit funny. We could definitely add more cases to this. We could say, given a feed of plant data is not available, what do we do then? So let's think about when our dependencies start dropping off. How does our program handle it? Before long, we could very easily come up with many, many examples from this one simple scenario. Now, why do we put them in given when then syntax? Well, given when then syntax is easy to translate to code. Take a look at our first test. Given a feed of plant data is available, when I search for Redbud, then I should receive at least one result with these attributes. Now let's look at our source code. And I know we haven't covered how to write a unit test yet, but this is just a preview of what's to come. So you see, search for Redbud returns Redbud. Given a feed of plant data are available, when search for Redbud, then result contains Eastern Redbud. And these are methods that are being called that will essentially create this test. But you see it matches almost perfectly word for word. Given a feed of plant data is available when I search for Redbud, then I should receive these results. If we look at the next one, given a feed of plant data is available when I search for Quercus, then I should receive, and then I have two different unique results listed below. So we scroll down and we take a look at this. Once again, we see the at test annotation and we see search for Quercus returns multiple oaks, which essentially captures this requirement fairly well. And then we see given a feed of plant data are available, we're allowed to uh, reuse that method from our previous test. When search for two oaks, then return two oaks. So again, looks a lot like this test. And finally, given a feed of plant data is available when I search for some kind of junk, then I should receive no results. So search for garbage returns nothing. Given a feed of plant data is available uh, when I search for garbage, then I get zero results. So these are all tests that are a reflection of this document. And this document was written by multiple contributors so that we know that we're capturing not just the developers thought about what a test should look like, but everybody's thought on what the test should look like, or at the very least, multiple stakeholders. Now I can right click and choose run and it will run this test. And the value of it is that it ensures that everything I'm testing for does indeed pass. So we should see, sure enough, several check marks appear over here on the left hand side. Now, what's also nice is we can build this into a CI CD pipeline or continuous integration, continuous delivery pipeline. So I can scroll down and I can go ahead and commit this directory with any changes that I've made. So we'll say update unit tests. And then we'll go ahead and do a commit and push. Now we'll take a look at Circle CI, which is a continuous integration pipeline that I've wired up to my GitHub repository where this is stored. You can see it has a history of a few failed builds that I had and then one that was successful. I'll go over to my development environment and confirm that I want to do the push. Then we'll watch this screen carefully. This is pushing to GitHub, so as soon as GitHub receives it, it's going to essentially send a notification to CircleCI. And then CircleCI will do a build and run the test, and we can see now, without any intervention of mine, it's popped in here and it's gone to running. And we can take a look and we can watch as it spins up the environment, checks out the code, and walks through several steps, including running the tests. I'll fast forward this because it will take a few moments. Now you see it's on the run test step, so it's done everything, and now it's going to run those tests that we've written. And voila, run test has passed. We can take a look here and see some of the details, but nonetheless, we now see that we were able to take the thoughts that all of our stakeholders have, put them into a document, 
work them into our source code, and then also work them into our CI/CD pipeline so that we can have some fundamental understanding that even as we make changes going forward, provided that these tests pass, we have met the requirements that we have for our application. That is a behavior-driven design requirements document. You see a little sign-off here, uh, some kind of revision history, a two-pager, fits very well with the concept of the Agile Software Manifesto, and also fits well with our concept of behavior-driven design unit tests. So I'm curious what experience you've had with these or what ways you've found that work. If you found, find ways that work better, put it in the comments. I'd love to know. Thank you.